you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. Believe it or not, this is our 200th episode. Now, I'm, I would ask for a show of hands out there as to all the people who've seen all 200 episodes. <laughs> Will they win a prize? <laughs> it would be a miraculous thing, let me tell you. That certainly, they should deserve a great prize, but it's hard to believe 200 episodes. I know. I can't believe that. You know, it just, it time flies. But think of all that's gone on in the last... 200 plus weeks. Right. I mean, the world's changed. So it, much of it, you know, revolving around the pandemic. Yeah, a lot of it, a lot yeah. of it. And, um, and, and you know, it's, we, we try to come back to estate planning periodically. Uh, we're not great at that. We, we really should do it more often. Tucker Allen sponsors this show, so we should be more mindful of that. Uh, and I think that I think it's a wonderful topic. I think a lot of our listeners want to know this stuff about um, in a time when things are uncertain, the balance of their life, can they continue to care for themselves? Yeah. And if they can't, who's going to do it? Um, and what about all this talk about tax changes coming down yes. the road? Um, you know, we wonder about our health, our children's health, our grandchildren's health. So. We want to come back and visit on the subject of estate planning as well as life planning, which is really a better word. So appropriately enough uh, to sort of participate in this discussion, we have a wonderful guest this week, Jim Gow. Now, I don't think, Jim, you've been on this show before. I have not. Okay. Well, Jim is an attorney with Tucker Allen, and uh, his practice is limited strictly to matters relating to later life planning, estate planning, uh, planning for incompetence, uh, the uh, trying to achieve goals for children and grandchildren. So maybe that's a good jumping off point. Um, I think we should start by talking a little bit about some of the primary tools that you use to sort of provide benefits to not only people themselves, our clients, for the balance of their lives, but let's focus for a minute on what they can do for the benefit of a surviving spouse or especially children and even grandchildren. What's the primary tools in your toolbox? Uh, so, I mean, when you're dealing with the actual client themselves, obviously, first thing comes to mind is powers of attorney. So they've got to draft, you know, a power of attorney, name somebody to take care of them, make their health care, financial decisions. Um, and then what most people think of is a will. Um, but I always say a will is just a letter to a judge that says, dear judge, this is who I want to get my stuff and this is who I want to be in charge of getting it there. If there's a judge involved, obviously that's the probate court, which everyone wants to avoid the big, right. the big bad probate court. vulnerable to court challenges too, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's a good point, a letter to a judge. I hope everybody picks up the significance of that. It means you're, as you said, you're in front of a judge. And so many people, I don't know where this myth gets started that you avoid probate by having a will. Yeah. It almost ensures probate. Yeah, yeah. And I think people are saying, well, but we're told we need to have a will. What well, kind of the point of people who say that, and that still is a common sort of recommendation, a common maxim that people have from professionals. But really what they're saying is you need to have in place some sort of plan. And if you don't, when you die, then the state is going to determine who gets what. And rarely does that represent what your particular desires yeah. are. So so people use a will to make that point, but you're saying well, the point's good except for using a will. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into what people think of as a revocable living trust. And that's the, the most commonly used tool nowadays. Um, it does avoid probate. It's not that letter to a judge. It's a rule book that you put in place to put a trustee in charge of your assets, your trust assets for your beneficiaries, which, you know, kids, grandkids, great grandkids, et cetera. And it's all tailored to your specific goals. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's where, uh, that's why it's, you know, 60 to 80 pages. And it's that rule book that you put the trustee, you know, he, they have to follow this rule book. And, and it goes on much after you, you pass away. It doesn't end at your death. And, and some people think, though, that this is somehow this very complicated, sophisticated machinery 
uh, that they they kind of wince when they hear somebody bring up the subject of a trust. But the reality is that a trust is really very simple. It can become complex, but I really want people to get that it's really very simple. As a matter of fact, some legal theorists say it's not an entity, not this thing, so much as it's a relationship. And this is a big, we, we study this in law school. So I like the idea of a relationship. So really all you're doing is choosing someone, or it could be a company, it could be a bank, but let's assume it's somebody in your family, maybe a trusted brother-in-law or brother or uncle. But you're choosing someone, you're saying to them, look, I'm going to transfer title to assets to you, but you're holding them as a trustee in which you're promising that everything you do with these assets are going to help the beneficiaries that I've named. Right. And furthermore, as you said, a rule book, furthermore, you can attach rules, and you would attach rules. You'll say, now, I don't want it paid out until you know my these beneficiaries are 25, or I only want it paid out for good reasons. And, oh, incidentally... Don't give them any money if they're behaving in a reckless way or if they're in bankruptcy or there's any judgment against them. So it's really simple as that. So people who think that when they hear the word trust, that it's something they can't hope to possibly understand, you can understand the basics. And it's really that. What would you add to that description? Absolutely. It's it's In the end, it's, it's a relationship between three parties. It's the grantor, which is normally you, the person setting up the trust, that trustee, which is the trusted person that you're putting in charge of it, and then the, the beneficiaries, which are the ones that benefit from, from it. Right. Um, yeah, those three parties. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it is really, it's a close-knit relationship. Uh-huh. Um, and I think people, when they hear trust fund, they think, well, now I've got to run to, you know, ABC Bank anytime I want to get access to my money. And it's just not the case. Um, take your personal checking account, for example. That's the easiest example. You set up a trust. You don't even have to get a new bank account number. It doesn't file its own taxes. You don't have to get a new checkbook. Um, you just change the name that comes on the statement. And when you're alive and well, you're the all three parties and you you do whatever you want. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of this, isn't it, is that... Um, it is these three relationships, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple where a, a beneficiary might, in one scenario, they might call the trustee and say, I need money for such and such. I want to buy a new house. So your rules may say, of course, you know, the trustee gives them the money. But you may have rules, though, that are a little more protective of the beneficiary mm-hmm. in which um, the beneficiary is allowed to make decisions about discretion. But as you, as your example pointed out, that could be the next generation because it often starts out with with you, the client, meaning the client creates it. So it's a trust in place in which the client is wearing all three hats at first, right? Right, right. And it's even during the life for you know the standard revocable trust is just that it's revocable, and so the client has the ability to change the rules as they go, um, or until, throw it out the window, or throw it out the window completely. Exactly. Yeah. And then when they die is when that it becomes irrevocable and, you know, the true discretion comes into play. Or and, or, or they become incompetent. Or, be, or they become yeah. incompetent, and, yes. and, and that's the beauty of this. We, you, need, you should talk a little bit about the succession, how you start out wearing all three hats and people are thinking, well, what good is that? But the beauty is the success. You get to name who gets those roles. Talk a little bit. Right. So if, if a client becomes uh, incompetent, they can no longer obviously be the trustee. They can't be in charge of anything. They can't make their own decisions. So they name a trusted successor. And then the rule book says, okay, you know, you've stepped in, take care of me. This is my money to begin with. Take care of me while I'm still living, um, even though I can't do it. So it's almost, that's where the trustee and the power of attorney roles really are are almost merged. Yeah, very similar right. ideas. Yeah. And, and that, so... You're, you have everything in place so that when you get up in the morning every day, especially this audience, this audience is above 65. Um, so you have the, the peace of mind of knowing that when you begin each day, if something happens, you know, if it's a car wreck, if it's a stroke, if right. you fall down that the steps. That your wishes will be carried out. Yeah, that immediately somebody steps into your position lawfully to be able to make decisions, to be able to access your accounts to pay your rent, to uh, to pay your life insurance, whatever premiums. That, think of all the things that have to happen. Somebody has to do for you. 
And I can tell you that if you don't have something like this in place or a durable power of attorney, if that event happens, then it means that somebody's going to court. You know, yeah, th- absolutely. You're in crisis mode then. Yep. yep. And now you've got doctors involved that have to come and testify. You've got a guardian ad litem. So you get more attorneys involved than you really even wanted to to begin with. And guess who's paying for all this? <laughs> That'd be you. you. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. coming out of your estate. So, um, so it, it. on the other hand, the good news is if you don't have that accident, if you don't fall down the stairs, if, if you don't have a stroke, then you continue to run your life. And, and that's what some people don't understand is they think whenever they create a trust that they're surrendering authority. There is this thing called, and, and you should probably talk a little bit about this, there is this thing called an irrevocable trust. That's created for some other reasons. Uh, that's not probably not what a majority of our clients use, but a lot of our clients will choose that. That's a little bit of a different thing. You're seeking tax advantages and other advantages uh, to where you have to give up a little bit of control. Can you just describe that a little bit? Absolutely. So the, the main use of an irrevocable or irrevocable trust nowadays is asset protection or, or Medicaid qualification. Yeah. Um, and so basically you set up this permanent rule book now during your life um, and you transfer your assets over to it. But in order to get that asset protection, you have to either give up access or control of it. And so if you transfer it over and you're trying to get asset protection, well, that that those assets can no longer be used by you for you just anytime you want because then a court can say, well, you can use it for any purpose. You have total control. It's it's not really an – it's just an alter ego of you. Use it to pay your judgment. Yeah, anything that sounds too good to be <laughs> true in the law, not always, but usually is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if somebody is suggesting to you – that you can have what's called asset protection. What that means is, you know, if you have a lawsuit, if you have a car accident and somebody sues you, uh, if there were any sort of bankruptcy, if you file bankruptcy, their creditors couldn't get at, you know, all your assets are protected. That sounds a little too good to be true. Now, there are ways in which, though, that can be true. It can be true if you limit your control. So in, in that way, it does kind of make sense that, that, that what Jim's describing is if you limit your control some, then you can expect to have some protection. You expect to be able to legitimately say, look, these assets are not mine in the real sense of the word. So um, so there are places, that's one example, and you mentioned taxes. So there are reasons that people create irrevocable. And another advantage, though, another thing about the irrevocable is I guess that's what in most for most of our clients, that happens the moment that they become incompetent, Correct. Uh, it, it, yes, because the the grantor is the only one that really possesses the right to revoke or amend. And yeah. so if they're incompetent, there's no one there anymore right. too. It's not technically irrevocable, but there's no one that can revoke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They'd have to go to court to have authority to do that. Yeah. You know, one thing I really do like about trust is you can put in that condition that if anybody tries to sue, tries to challenge the trust, that they're automatically cut out. You isn't that the, the case? The no contest clause. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So if 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 you you've got three kids and and you just happen to love two of them a little bit more and give them a little bit more of the pie, and the third one comes out and says, "Well, that's that's not what mom and dad wanted. That's I, I, I should get it all." Well, now you get nothing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and and often uh, you know the parents' ideas about what's just and fair are different from some of the children. And and some people, many experts in this field suggest that parents can head off some of these disputes if they give kids an idea of what's coming. Yeah. But I think parents are just, they dread that conversation. <laughs> Definitely not over Thanksgiving dinner. No. So so they, they just think it's going to be as to one or more of their children, they think it's going to be an unhappy conversation, so they never have it. So parent dies. And then in defense of this child that challenges a trust or a will, in their defense, they didn't see this coming. Maybe they should have, but they didn't. So they think, usually it's something like this, you know, I'm the out-of-town kid. So my brother and sister were there every day. They were alone with mom and dad. Manipulating. Yeah, mom was declining. Dad had died, we'll say. Mom was declining. So there was such opportunity to have an undue influence. Mm-hmm. And so often the out-of-town kid has a, a genuine belief, which may be incorrect, a genuine belief that, that that's not what their parents would have done. And, you know, there is a fairness to that. I mean, the out-of-town kid, I get this. I'm an out-of-town <laughs> kid. My brother is with my, lives in the same 
uh, town with my mother who lives next door. And he gives her more physical time because he's there. He's there. And uh, I can see how a parent in that case, not my mother, I don't think, but who knows. <laughs> <laughs> but I may be one of these this people. This may be a shock. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but, you know, I would understand a parent in that case or any other saying, you know, th- this, this one child was there every day, worked so hard, took care of me, two-thirds to that child or, or even more. And I think it's that, those scenarios that often trigger these disputes. But as you point out, you can, you can have mechanisms that discourage it. You can, yeah. So the no contest clause, it's it's built into every trust that says, you know, if anybody does come and tries to take this to court to, you know, force the a change to it, then then you know, to discourage that cost, we say they don't get anything at that point. So Jim, if a parent say does not want to have that dreaded conversation with the kids about, you know, Billy's getting more than Sally, whatever, does it happen that um a parent maybe leaves a letter with the lawyer's office yep. so and you, explains why, you know, I did my trust this way. You can go one better. You can put it in the actual trust document. I mean, this is a fluid rule book that we want to put in things like, and it's got to be a little bit more detailed for, than four reasons he will understand <laughs> we leave him with, yeah. you know, $1. Um, yeah, but you can put either a letter attached to the trust or you put it in the trust document itself. Um, you know, explaining this is exactly why I did this. And at the end of the day, if it does get taken to court, the court looks to the settlor's intent. So putting that intent in the four corners of the document is the best way to show what that was. Makes it more secure. Absolutely. Now, what is an incentive trust? So an incentive trust is we've got this rule book, and in that rule book, we put things incentivizing beneficiaries to act in the way that maybe the parents want them to act or expect them to act. Controlling or, beyond the grave. Yeah, it is. It is it is parenting, parenting from the grave. You got the hands sticking up out of the out of the, the dirt. dirt. <laughs> um, but, I like this show. I need to get some tips for my daughters. <laughs> <laughs> well look, all parents all parents continue to be worried about their children yeah. as they grow up and and as they continue to you know, their life evolves. Some parents are more involved than others. Some parents are regularly helping their kids out financially who get into scrapes from time to time. So I don't find it at all unreasonable that a parent who's leaving a lot of assets to children, their life's work really, to their children, that they want to have confidence that it'll be used in the way that's best for their children. I know there are strong opinions on both sides of this. There, I, yeah. If we were to allow people to raise their hand and make comments, I, I would argue that maybe half the room would say, this is just my experience, is sitting in, in rooms doing interviews. Mm-hmm. Tell me if, you, if you've had a similar experience. About half the people that I meet with say, look, you know, they're beyond a certain age. Now, if they're under, say, 25, they're more willing to do that. Sometimes under 30, they're more willing to have controls. Mm-hmm. But, but when their kids are over 30, at least half clients just say, let it be. You know, I'm going to put it in their hands, and if they don't have any better sense than to go out and blow it, uh, what can I do for them? Yep. You know, do you see that? Absolutely. Yeah, I have the exact same experience. It, it really is. It's about the age. It's 30, 35-ish, and they say the kids are the kids. It, exactly. If they want to run to Vegas and put it on red, then that's that's their choice. And I'll be dead anyway <laughs> is normally the response. So, Well, we've all seen the type of movie, Jim, where you have this millionaire with the wayward grandson and the grandfather's at his wit's ends and puts this condition in the will that if my grandson's, say, not married by the age of 30 and bears a son, cut out. I, I mean, does it get that controlling? Have you seen anything like that? Uh, I have. So, I mean, I've seen anything as far as it, as simple as they need to graduate college before they can get any of this money. And that or, seems to be worthwhile. Yeah. Right? yeah. I think that's reasonable. Yeah. But then you, you start having people say, oh, well, you know, college maybe isn't worth the money as much as it used to be. What about an, just an associate's degree? Um, and so you have to be really clear with these incentive provisions because if you're not, the trustee has to follow what you wrote, and if it says a four-year degree and your kid got in a car wreck and all of a sudden can't get that four-year degree, well, now we've essentially disinherited him. <laughs> huh, that is that's that's interesting. something to think about. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that no. scenario. 
and or your kid becomes a professional athlete. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's now, well, now to, they're making millions from, from high school. You know, <laughs> so they don't need the inheritance right, anyway. Right. Um, yeah, it is something that you have to think about. And let me—I'll be devil's advocate though about how important I would argue f- to those people who say, "Look, beyond a certain point, we'll call it age 30, I'm going to give them the money, and they're adults; they got to deal with it." Here are the things, though, that make that really painful. Is as somebody who spent a lot of years as a divorce lawyer and still uh, am involved with Cordell and Cordell. Uh, I can tell you that parents just hate to see like their life's work, half of it, going into the hands of a man or a woman that is the soon to be the ex-spouse, or they see it coming. And they know that once they've gifted those assets, that if there's a divorce that goes through, that those assets are likely to be divided 50-50. Now, it's possible with proper planning to dot your I's and cross your T's like good lawyers often can to keep those assets as separate assets. It's not that it's impossible, so don't misunderstand my point. But let me tell you the practical effect. In divorce court, probably 80 to 90 percent of the time at least, some would say higher than 90, that those assets, some portion of those, end up as marital because people don't behave that way. The same person that chose to marry that woman, for example, that will assume it's it, that the woman is the in-law, that, that son that chose to marry her, the same judgment that suggested that perhaps he marry this person that was a mistake is the same judgment that's going to govern when you leave him a million dollars. Guess what account it's going in? It's going into a joint account. Yeah. It's not going to be treated you know, like this very scrupulous accountant might treat it. That's not what young or most couples do, period, young or old, is it's going to be go into assets, and some of those assets are going to be in joint names. If real estate's bought, depending on what state you're in, it's going to be in joint names. Uh, if it's put in an investment account, it's put in your retirement account, it gets commingled. I mean, whether you intend it or not, the probability is that some port, the overwhelming probability is some portion of that's going to end up in the hands of one of the people on the planet that you like least, I would argue. And so for me, the thought, I'll, I'll be frank that I have two daughters and, and they're both still, they're in graduate school, but, uh, but I think about this. And so my estate planning would be estate planning that would, that would not place everything in their hands. Absolutely. Now, nowadays, the word, uh, the term outright distribution is a dirty word <laughs> in yeah. estate planning because that means that you've written them a check for their total inheritance. And like you said, they ran straight to the joint bank account and now it's commingled and hard to trace and they yeah. have a divorce. Or in the event, they run the proverbial bus full of surgeons off the highway and now they've got a big lawsuit, lawsuit against them. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that That's another thing that you have to think about. It's not just divorce by any means. Divorce is a big issue because it's so common uh, and its implications are so severe in terms of division of assets. But but as you mentioned, liability. I mean, you can just have a car accident. Um, it can be some sort of... of um, Bankruptcy. A lot of people who who aren't who don't have bad judgment, they go into a business, and and this is very common with entrepreneurs who someday become yeah. successful. Is you 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 ask them about their early career, and and the nature of business is that you, your early businesses often fail, so you have to recover. Well, you can't recover when all those assets that you inherited are available to pay creditors. And anything that you would have had to build your life with, to rebuild, to do something different is gone. So you have the chance, people who are planning have the chance through using trust, using trust, and this isn't just for rich people. I assume I'm talking to middle-class people. Um, you have a chance to take whatever your nest egg is, 500000 a million, two million, whatever it is. You have the ability to be sure that that's used for your children's benefit for the balance of their lives or for some period of their lives. You know, I'm not suggesting you always withhold it for their entire lives. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not withholding it. I'm just having it, as you described, it's in the hands of a trustee. So and, it's distributed then? Is yeah. That what, okay. It's available under liberal terms, and, uh, and I think that's a good idea. So um, I, want, I want my children to enjoy the fruits of my labor, as, as I'm sure all the people listening to us now— we at this table, all three of us, we want to think that children can enjoy the benefits. But 
I think the idea that you know, for example, of weaknesses or vulnerabilities that your children have and you don't do anything about it, you just say, look, they're on their own. I've helped them all I can. I've left this world here. Take it. Good luck. I mean, I, I, I disagree with that philosophy, though. It's very common. I think that instead to know as you're going out the door, to know those particular vulnerabilities and shortcomings of your children, and and you could plan and protect them from those things because you know them better than anybody on the earth. Right. Better than their spouse, probably. And and to not protect them when you can just doesn't make sense to me. I, so I don't see it as ruling from the grave, I guess. Well, and, you know, when you when you put it in what we call a lifetime trust, which is what we're talking about here in, instead of an outright distribution, you build in provisions for it to be potentially a long-lasting dynasty trust where, okay, it goes to my children for their lives, but then after they pass away, we're just going to do the same thing for grandkids and great-grandkids. And now you're three, four generations down the road, and really, no one has had to even do their own estate planning because you've had this money and you built in that automatic right. succession. Yeah, talk a little more about that and and explain how people don't have to start out being rich to do this because despite these low interest rates that we have right now, historically, interest rates have been 5 to 10%. So if you figure the compounding that takes place over a generation or less for what portion is not distributed... I mean, you're, you could take a five hundred thousand, certainly a million dollar estate, and you could you could generously provide for your children and reserve some for grandchildren. Right, and so you can even you can go so far as to limit access. So you've got one, maybe t- let's say two million dollars you put in this trust. So that's fifty to one hundred thousand dollars potentially. It's generating generating an interest, if if my math's right there, and you know they can you can say distribute all income out all that interest income to the children every year. And that way they claim it on their personal taxes. We're not paying any high trust tax rates on it. And you're preserving the principal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing we can't fail to talk about, I mean, we hit it obliquely, but I want to come back to it. One reason some people, one reason alone that a lot of people do trust is simply to avoid probate. Now, we started out by saying that, you know, Will has you in front of a judge, but... I want you to understand how simple it can be to pass assets from one generation to another if you have a trust in place. Can I describe that process? You, you, you set the trust up, you sign the stack of papers, and then that stack of papers is now going to own your stuff. <laughs> it's, it really is that simple. And once it owns the stuff, you pass away. Well, the, the trust didn't. The trust didn't die. And so it just ca- continues on in that name. Um, we have to get a tax ID number at that point, but that's pretty much it. Um, and then the accounts stay, you know, wherever they are, whether it be TD Ameritrade, Bank of America, uh, Edward Jones, one, any of those places. Um, and it just stays there and the trustees succeed, the beneficiaries, there's the succession there. And it, it, it really is that simple. It doesn't move at all. <laughs> yeah. And, and people often think, though, that a will does that for them. And I think the way you expressed it makes the most sense. Think of a will as governing anything that you own, that is that you own when you die. Now, some things, they might not pass into your estate because the moment you die, there's a rule that says it goes to somebody else. But, but for the most part, assets that you own when you die, you individually own, they end up in probate because they have yeah. to. That's the purpose of probate is to figure out who should get these. And let's be sure that anybody you owe money to gets paid first. So probate serves a, there's a reason it exists. And, and yet you can sidestep it and you can sidestep it in the way that Jim was just describing. Uh, so the important thing is to keep in mind, if you own the assets in your name when you die, they're probably going through probate. But if you create a trust, put them in the name of the trust, even a trust that you can continually change. You didn't lose control before you died. You, you had complete control. And yet when you died at that moment, there wasn't anything to go into your estate because it was in the trust. And as you said, the trust goes on. Right. right. So uh, one thing that I think that we should talk about too, and I, I'm, car- I'm a little leery about going down this road because it can get more complicated. But I think now that we've set a good foundation for revocable trust, um, at least a acceptable foundation. We could talk about this a lot more. 
But now let's talk a little bit about that thing that we mentioned a while ago, the irrevocable trust and why some people choose it. We don't have to get too specific, but uh, we mentioned a while ago that that asset protection and taxation are two big concerns. Um, I guess I would add to that another one, and that's Medicaid. Uh, and that may fall into the category of asset protection. So um, let's talk a little bit about Medicaid planning, but we won't get far in the weeds because for us to do this, to talk about Medicaid planning, which involves irrevocable trust, that's we've done two and three show segments yeah. on that single topic. And still, I'm sure some people were confused. So I'll admit, uh, trusts are not always simple, I, but a revocable trust that we've been talking about now and the fundamental idea of a trust is real simple. And if you're still confused about that, you just need to rewind this and, and listen to the first part again because it's pretty straightforward. Now, the irrevocable, where we mentioned a while ago, you do surrender some control. While you're alive. While you're alive. Yeah, while you're alive and competent. Mm-hmm. Um, so you surrender some control, and your first thought would be, well, I need to have a good reason to do that. You're right. You wouldn't want to do that without a good reason. And, and we mentioned th- some of those reasons. But I want to talk specifically here, just 10 or 15 minutes, we'll talk a little bit about this. So at least you'll know that there are occasions in which there is irrevocable trust, which is a step that you take more carefully. And why would you do it? And we're going to talk about it as it applies to Medicaid. So uh, a little, I guess, the overview of Medicaid and how you qualify for it. So in Missouri, you've got to spend down, if you're a single person, you've got to spend down to $5,000 or less, which is generous. It used to be $999 or less. So we're getting we're getting a little bit better. Um, but that's exactly that. If you have more than $5,000, you've got to pay for the nursing home yourself. Right. And so the first thing people think, well, okay, I'll just give all my money to my kids. Well, okay, but <laughs> now your kids have all your money and you're trusting them to be good with it, I guess, and you don't have any kind of a rule book like a trust That's to an govern That's awful, that. awful idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a good one. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so then you can set up an irrevocable trust and you gift your money to that instead. Now, there is a look back. There's the five-year look back for Medicaid, so if you give anything away— the state will look back over five years and penalize you based on it's based on the average cost of care in the in the region. So if you give away a hundred thousand dollars, they divide that by sixty five hundred, and you get you get how many months you have to pay privately. Um, but the irrevocable trust is a great tool for this because you gift it away, and you actually write the rules of how it's supposed to be used while you're alive, so you don't have to watch it get just needlessly spent by your children that you gave it away to. Mm-hmm. And it's huge because um, when we look at, number one, the prevalence of people that spend some period of time in long-term care, and we know it's a it's a lot of people, and we see that number going up, and I, it keeps changing. The last and I the heard is that— the cost of home, nursing homes. Oh, yeah. Well, the last I heard, though, is that the, the average person will spend something like seven months in some sort of facility, whether it's—it um, could be a nursing home, could be assisted living— uh, but some period of time. I think that might go up as our capabilities progress to keep people alive. Um, but either way, as you said, cost of the medical care has gone through the ceiling. There are insurance companies, many, several insurance companies are in the industry of selling insurance for long-term care. They're almost all bankrupt now. I think there's one that's around. Yeah. And GE, GE may very well fail because of this very issue. They dumped this insurance years ago and they kept some liability in order to get the buyer to take it and they miscalculated the cost of nursing home care. Because early on, in fairness to these companies, who would have thought that it would cost this incredible amount of money? And a lot of it's due to pharmacology, you know, patents, which I, I don't, I don't begrudge companies who've done research, but so we have sophisticated stuff now that's available and it costs money. So, so now when you're looking at the possibility of paying out 10000 a month, it's not unusual. I mean, we're cheap here. When you mentioned right. 6500 that's rural Missouri mainly, right? Uh, it's the average. That's the, the penalty divisor that the state uses, which I believe is statewide, uh-huh. which obviously rural areas are going to drag that down. They do. Yeah, yeah. but and, 6500 10000 either way, your estate's going to be eaten up in no yeah, time. Yeah, right. But, but I, I just want people to realize that the number that they should plan with is a lot higher, especially with this inflation. Right. So it's really naive to think that if you're planning for 10 years out, 
or 15, that you're going to be anywhere near, let's assume in St. Louis, incidentally, it's like 10,000 bucks for a nice long-term care. So you really have to plan assuming right. closer to 15. And I don't think that's being too pessimistic. So think about that, $15,000 a month. So when we talk to to our audience and our clients, most of whom are middle class, they have some assets. If they're willing to take everything they worked for and saved, most of them could say, fine, I'm not going to plan for Medicaid. I'm just going to plan to use what I've saved my whole lifetime for my long-term care. And and that would work. Uh, that's a plan. So just so you know, we'll, we'll, we, we put that up there as, as one option. But the good news is there's another option, and, and that's to simply – uh, create a trust. It's a little more complicated. I'll let you take it a few more steps down the road. Yeah. So you set up a trust, you name, normally it's the kids as the trustee. Um, and normally it's the kids as the beneficiary. And that's, that's totally allowable, um, because you're not a beneficiary and that's the main thing. So the, the money is no longer then available to pay for your care. And so the state can't force you to take money or force really the, the kids who are the trustees um, or a corporate trustee can be used to. Um, they cannot force that trustee to use the money you put in that trust after the five years um, to pay for your care. Yeah. And it's important to know, too, your house goes into that trust mm-hmm. because Medicaid can come back and take your house. It's called a state recovery. So yes. they will put a lien on your real estate for the amount that they've paid out. And then they say it's exempt and, you know, it's, but there's a lien on it. So when the kids go to sell the house when they inherit it, well, now they've got to pay the lien off. So the state's going to get their money that way. Yeah. Yeah. This is a complicated subject. And really what we ought to do is come back. Revisit it. As we, every sentence that we utter, you know, we, (laughs) I want to throw in, you know, a, a a comment or a, or a qualification and we really need to take a couple of shows and dedicate it to this. We haven't done that in a while. The rules have changed a little bit. Maybe we can do that uh, in the next two to three weeks. If Jim wants to come back with us. I'm happy to. Jim? (laughs) Okay. Um, So, but but I don't want to wrap up today until we talked a little bit more about it. Um, People are thinking, okay, there's this five-year look back. So what that means is that if you give it away today, you... If you want to avoid a penalty, so to speak, you've got to wait a certain number of months. And and the thing is, that goes back five years. So if you're doing planning, for a lot of our clients, they're not in a crisis today. But there are some people who are doing, and we call it crisis planning, meaning when they come into your office, the moment they sit down, they have a crisis. Somebody's been diagnosed with you know, a cancer or, or Parkinson's that is progressive and that they think very soon they see on the her- near horizon that they're going to have to have this. So they can't plan for five years out. And the good news is there are different solutions, but there are solutions for that. Mm-hmm. So it, at that point, the crisis planning comes down to being a math problem. You know, we, how, what is your level? How many assets do you have? What's the value of your total assets? Okay, it's X dollars. X dollars, let's say X dollars does pay for five years worth of care. Okay, well then we put anything in excess of the amount we need into the irrevocable trust and that money will last us the five years and then we apply. Um, now everybody's not going to be that lucky to have five years of, of nursing home Or they fees. may not want to use five years. They, want to fi- they may want a solution that allows them to reduce it some. Right, and so at that point we have just tons of tools. We can either... Uh, shift some money over to the children that are helping care for you using a personal services agreement or a personal care contract. Um, And so you pay the kids for what they're already doing and helping out. And then that way it gets it out of your bank account into theirs. It's it's taxable income, but it's negligible. Um, And you could spend down some of it. You could put money into exempt assets. Uh, You could prepay funerals. Those are exempt. Yeah. Um, if there's a stay-at-home spouse, the house is exempt and not, you know, no estate recovery is allowed there. Um, so you put a new roof on the house. You put, yeah. you know, redo the bathrooms, the kitchens. Or modify the home for, you know, say you're having difficulty walking. Right. For the spouse who's staying there. The other's sure. going to be an institution. Right. But one other thing we should mention here that um, I haven't dealt with as much lately, but I know the big emphasis now and probably will be more so in the future is getting Medicaid qualification for home and community-based 
services. Yeah, so, stay-at-home health care. Yeah, so those rules are a little different. The concepts are the same, mm-hmm. but the rules are a little different. But that would be the scenario where somebody's at home, they're not in long-term care, they're getting Medicaid to pay their expenses, uh, but it's a, it's a little bit of a separate problem, but the basic guidelines are the same. Another thing that, that you can do is you can do what's called, uh, there are various strategies. You can call it do a half loaf, and we won't get into that. But it's an idea where you can give some of your money away, pay a penalty, and you're still ahead as to 50% that you're out. So the good news is if, if you're not able to plan and look down the road five years, which about half our clients cannot, then we still can save them a lot of money. But again, it varies from person to person because it depends on the particular asset you have, how much money we're talking about, how soon somebody needs to enter long-term care. So it, it's a very specific situation. So nobody can tell you what you in particular can save without somebody working through your assets and your situation. But but the other half of our clients, though, are people who do think, yeah, there's a, at least a 50% chance or more that, that we'll be fine for five years. Uh, and we just want to do this for insurance, so to speak, personal uh, uh, security. So so for those people, it's a piece of cake. You can take a million dollars. You can take $2 million or more and, and place it into a trust, an irrevocable trust that meets your criteria, and that will be safe and they will still qualify for Medicaid, right? Right, after, after the five years, yep. Yeah, so... So in, on the one hand, it can be very simple. In other cases, it's more complicated. But the point is, in all those cases, you can do better by planning, even if it's a crisis planning situation where you don't have the notice you'd like to have. Um, what comment would you make to people who say, well, gee, that doesn't seem right that you would have a million dollars and might still choose to get Medicaid? We're playing by the rules. <laughs> I mean, the, the the federal government in each state runs the Medicaid program, and They've built in the exemptions. They've built in that we didn't come They've up with okayed the five year. It. Yeah, right. We didn't come up with the five right. year look back. They did. So that's their way of making sure that only the people that I mean, only the people that should qualify do qualify. And we're just playing by their rules. Yeah, and that that's the best point to make is we're playing by the rules that were created by the government. The same thing people do with taxes. Um, we all agree that people shouldn't cheat on taxes. Nobody approves of that, but I think everybody, I would suspect all of us can agree that that we should take the tax deductions right. that are available to us. And if we can you know, invest money in certain areas where we avoid taxes, we all think that's legitimate. The government knows that those are areas that are permitted without taxes for you to invest in. Um, often those are designed to induce you to do those things. So... I think I think that that your answer is as good as it can be, uh, and that's that. You know, all that that we can do, and I would argue that you should do, is play by the rules. But beyond that, we have duties to our families, and others. And and I, for me, I feel that I should take advantage of every tax opportunity I can, and every planning opportunity I can for the benefit of my family. So that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about planning to qualify for Medicaid and as a result, being able to preserve what you've worked a lifetime for. Exactly. So, Jim, when we were talking before about the uh, the irre- irrevocable trust and revocable trust, um, how do they relate to the incentive trust? Uh, so the incentives, an incentive trust can actually be revocable or irrevocable. Um, but the the benefit is, or the, the point, I guess, when the incentives kick in, the trust is usually going to be irrevocable. So you don't set up a revocable trust that says, I have to make a certain amount of money before I can take money out of my own revocable trust. Right. It, it's at the person's death that set the trust up, it becomes irrevocable. So say there's some extreme, extreme conditions in there. And... Um the heir wants to challenge it. Are those ever successfully challenged in court? It is. So modifications of an irrevocable trust have grown. We've we, the, the ability to re, to modify irrevocable trust, I should say, have has grown recently. Um, so uh, as soon as the and I don't want to necessarily get into the rule against perpetuity is everyone's favorite law school subject. That was um, the thing that kept me from getting that A and M. No, you're right. You're right. The rule against perpetuities. Every law school student just mm-hmm. 
You know, and, and now it's becoming less important. It is. So it used to be that a trust would have a definite end date in the future. They could not last forever. Uh, they would have to be terminated 21 years after the last person was al- that was alive when the trust was created died. Um, but it's been abolished in almost every state. I want to say almost, but it may be every state has abolished it. Um, so now you can tr- create what's called a, d- a dynasty trust, a true dynasty trust that will last generations. And because it lasts generations, there is absolutely no way we can tell the future and what's going to happen in 50, 100 years. Sure. Um, So you say challenging in court. Really, it's a petition. So let's say, let's go back to the example we used earlier. The trust says that, you know, Joe, my son, has to graduate college before he can take any money out of the trust. Joe gets hurt. Joe has a learning disability. Joe can't possibly graduate college. Well, now, like I said before, we've effectively disinherited him. So what he does is he petitions the court or someone on his behalf petitions the court to modify the irrevocable trust because the set law clearly didn't mean to disinherit him. Um, and so, so it can be changed after the person's death in yeah. a circumstance like that. Yep. Wow. Yep. Okay. So as, so as long as that it doesn't frustrate the purpose of the trust, it can be modified. Yeah. It, it, and I want I don't want people to be too concerned about that. They, others, some may be thinking, sitting on the side of the table of the, of the planning ancestor, they're saying, well, wait, does that mean that I can create this plan that can later be thwarted? The example that we just gave, though, is really when your plan becomes impossible, right. which is one of the bases under yep. law, is the intention has become impossible to fulfill or the, the stated process. So instead, what the court's allowed to do is to look at what your intent was. And this was common, incidentally, with charities. When one charity goes out, the, the court can say, well, did this person have a charitable intention? Were they wanting to give to charities generally, or did they only care about this particular one? In which case, then the trust might end, and it would be distributed to whatever linear heirs there were or whoever the trust provided. But more often than not, when a trust has gone out of business or changes have taken place, such as what you've mentioned over the next 50 to 100 years, things happen. Uh, uh, Educational institutions that you may have favored may no longer be there particularly given what's unfolding. You know, with probably a lot of universities, for example, that won't be here in another 10, 20 years. So, so things change. And, and it's really a good thing <clears throat> that the court is allow, will consider a, an alternative way of achieving your objective or an objective that, that is consistent with your goal. So really, I think that though some of us as, as grantors or testors we want to think that nothing will happen that that will change what we say, but there are things we want to happen, right? right? Absolutely. I mean, you can't be you can't create a document that's so inflexible that all of a sudden one small change happened and now your purpose is completely frustrated um, and your intent is is out the window. And now you've locked all your money in a lockbox with no way of getting it out because you've fine-tuned it so much that it's just completely unflexible. Um, I I see, you know, some of the most common incentives are the graduate from school. Um, Some people want them to, uh, you see, it's called an income matching provision. So dollar for dollar, what they make in salary, they can take out of the trust. Well, okay, I'm a stay-at-home parent. I am on disability. So things like that you didn't necessarily think of when you drafted the trust. So now we have to go back and, and, and petition for a modification. Yeah. Yeah. And, and many states also permit that if there are a number of beneficiaries and all beneficiaries agree, then there can be modifications, again, that are consistent with the intent of the, right. of the test store. Yep. A non-judicial settlement agreement. John, did it? yes, that's a good way to so put it. So you don't have to go to court in that Yep. Circumstance. Yeah. So if, if all the beneficiaries agree, and if actually during a lifetime irrevocable trust, if all the beneficiaries and the trustee ag- or the grantor agree, you can change it. But after someone's death, obviously they can't agree anymore. Um, but if all the beneficiaries agree, they can modify it outside of court, but it's limited to what the court could have done if they petitioned it. Yeah. Which would be something consistent with the intent or purpose of the trust. Right. So, um, 
these are all provisions that allow you to create something that can influence generations. And for some of you, maybe it's going to be two generations that you'll have in mind, your children, your grandchildren. And for some of you, because you may have more money, you may think in terms of additional generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's just a marvelous way to plan. And now remember, what we're describing here, though it's become irrevocable, this is the simple trust we talked about earlier in the show. We talked about how revocable works. You know, it's this thing that you can you can change any way you want once you create it. It has no controls on you. It doesn't limit your use of anything you want. But it's there, and you you have it sitting wonderfully in place so that when something happens to you, and that the thing could be death, it could be disability, but it could be death. So if it's uh, from that moment on, it becomes irrevocable. And what's nice about that is that you get to create a marvelous plan that's going to provide in a way that you want for your children and grandchildren. And one thing that that is available, and it, it's nice if when we include it, is for the creators of the trust to arrange for their children to be able to forego payments out. Because if they have a good income, let's assume your children are are professionals, they're, they're bringing in enough money, they don't need it. So it's marvelous for them to be able to keep it in the trust and they get to pass it on to their children that would have some tax benefits as well as other benefits. And so this thing accumulates, and it accumulates throughout your children's lifetime. There are ways for them to get at it. You know, we would include provisions so that if they want it, I think most of our clients say, yeah, I want my children to be able to use it even as adults and older adults. But they, but I want my children to be able to choose not to so that they can have this, this sitting beautifully to be paid out for the lives of their children. So in that case, you could have a smaller amount, $500,000 that you might fund a trust with, and yet that'll end up being a huge amount of money that would go to your grandchildren. Right. It's uh, and, and it'll be a state, like you said, a state tax exempt, uh, not for you, it's includable in your taxable estate, um, but the exemption's $11.7 million now, so people aren't necessarily worried. For a couple, 22. <laughs> for a couple, yes. Yeah. Um, so it, it, they can lock it in there, and it's not included in their taxable estate. It's it's generation skipping tax exempt, um, and so yeah, it can go to the grandkids, and we give them the discretionary power to, like you said, take it or leave it in there. Um, and if you know the discre- they exercise their discretion to take it out, it's normally for health, education, maintenance, and support. So yeah, anything. And, <laughs> and keep in mind, in addition to these other benefits, they have asset protection meaning that your kids will choose to leave it in there. They may, and if if they don't need it and they want to leave it for their children, then the beautiful thing about it is whatever happens to your kids, any sort of lawsuits, divorces, other such things, those assets are undisturbed, and that would apply to your grandchildren. So there's really no limit that I know of to these generations, at least no practical limit, uh, can, theoretically, of course. But if you wanted to go to a third generation, you could. Some people plan that way, but but many uh, many of our clients are happy to know that they've provided for their children and their grandchildren. Uh, but th- it, there's such flexibility and trust. You can. It, it, this is such a marvelous tool that I think people whose eyes glaze over or who feel intimidated or lose interest in this conversation very quickly, I think it is because they just don't get it. That it's on one level, trusts are very, very simple, as we've explained. Right. And it's not something that you should think is over your head. But the more you try to accomplish when it comes to more sophisticated things, yeah, then a trust gets a little more complicated. And I think, too, you had mentioned before that there's a misconception that trusts are only for the extremely wealthy, and that's not the case at all. No, not at all. It's no. It's a it's it's a will on steroids is what it is. I've heard that one before. <laughs> I like that. Yep. Yeah, I, I I would my start my starting assumption with a new client when I was doing just estate planning, the starting assumption would be that they needed a trust, uh, and it would be an unusual person that didn't. I mean, I guess you could you could have no assets in this world of any significance. Maybe uh, there are scenarios where you might say, okay, fine, do a will because it doesn't matter. And at some point, your assets can be so low that you can have an informal probate. 
And what do they call it in St. Louis County? Small estate. Small estate administration. So if you have a small estate administration, like less than 50,000 bucks or yep. something. It's 50,000 in Missouri, 100 in Illinois. It varies by state, but yeah. 50 in Missouri. So you avoid the normal probate process, and that's quick and simple. I just don't have many of those people walk in my office. Most people have worked some, and they've accumulated some things, and they've saved, and, and they're concerned about giving, preserving what they can for their children. So... Anyway, we've covered a lot of territory yes, in and... what we were less than an hour. Oh, so we've covered a lot of territory we in an hour. We certainly did. We, let's circle back. Let's focus on just on the subject of Medicaid. So we're going to come back. We're going to do a Medicaid show uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have to have it over a couple of. We'll have to plan this out so that we. We do can it. do that. We'll do it over several hours and break it into pieces. But uh, some of you will find that subject very interesting. Some of you may not. That's okay. If you have so much money that you never foresee yourself using, wanting to use Medicaid, uh, I get it. But, uh, but for a lot of people, including people who have money, some money, they think it's a great idea. So uh, you should be sure and tune in for that discussion. Yeah. And I want to bring up, too, since this is our 200th episode, um, thank our listeners, our viewers who have been with us all along the way. Mm. Yes, and um, and those that have have moved with us when we moved off a of radio. Yeah, um, we weren't sure how many of you would would follow us. We lost a few, um, who I think are simply not online, so to speak. But but many of you, the vast majority of you, made it over to us, and we're glad. We really work to make this content useful. Uh, while it's sponsored by Tucker Allen, and we, we want you to, to think of Tucker Allen when you're getting legal services of this sort, uh, more important than that to us and to Tucker Allen is that we provide you useful information that impresses you uh, and that you know that, that, uh, that this is a source that you can go to for reliable knowledge about how to plan, especially estate planning and, and later life planning. With that, we wrap up. This has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Ellen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.